Welcome to the long-awaited acrylic DVD. I am so proud of this particular DVD where I share with you all of my secrets and everything that I can possibly give as a gift to you as an artist, as a student. My acrylics have gone through a tremendous number of changes, upgrades, quality improvements, and today's acrylic paints are nothing like what we had back in the 60s and 70s when I first began. The DVD is set up in sections for both beginning and more advanced students. It also, along the way, shares with you many of the shortcuts that I use that makes acrylic painting so much fun, and I hope you'll enjoy it when you see all of those shortcuts. I've got some pretty radical ones in here. <laughs> there are actually three paintings, four, my goodness, I forgot about the horse. Yes, there are actually four paintings being done. The first one we're going to do is a still life. It's set up for more beginning painters. This is where you learn and how to handle it and some of the shortcuts that I've used before. In the still life you'll also have a a limited palette get you familiar with the handling of acrylic paints. In the second segment where I show you acrylics versatility we paint Uncle Willie. He's made out of all kinds of added things to the paint and what we add to the paint is both made by the manufacturer and also things that we find around our home. In the advanced painting, I take you on a journey where we go from a blank canvas to a finished painting. You'll learn how I handle acrylics painting from dark to light and also going from transparent to opaque colors. Okay, first thing you need to do is protect yourself. So what I like to do before I paint is I use some hand lotion. A good quality hand lotion, like this gold bond, seals my hands. Uh, by putting a moisturizer in the crevices and creases of my fingers, I make sure to get it underneath my fingernails and I rub it in really well. And what happens with this is that when I wash my hands after the painting session, all of the acrylic paint slips right off. Any really good quality um, hand lotion will work. Okay, uh, the next item on your list will be a palette. A palette is a surface on which you mix your colors and on which your colors stay while you paint. The palette that I currently prefer and always have since 1983 is a glass, quarter inch plate glass, under which I have painted a neutral gray value. This is not white. This is white. Notice the difference in value? There's a reason why I use a gray palette, and it has to deal with that cadmium red we mentioned before. This cadmium red light came straight from the tube, and it sits right there on that gray palette. It's absolutely gorgeous, isn't it? Now, look at that same cadmium red light in the middle of this white surface. It doesn't look nearly as brilliant. The reason being is the human eye likes to see intensity of color next to a neutral gray. It looks brighter. I have far more accuracy in mixing my colors when I start with a gray palette. The next item on your list is a glass scraper. I have two of them here to show you. This one is a small one and this is a large one and you can buy them from your hardware stores and I'm going to scrape up this paint with that glass scraper. One, wipe, two, wipe, three, done. Isn't that amazing? All of that paint came right off that glass in less time than it took to tell it. You're going to have to invest in some paper towels because you're going to be needing them for wiping up just as you saw here. But if that paint were dry, what I would grab would be my trusty dusty spray bottle. I have lots of spray bottles. The one criteria about a spray bottle with acrylics is that it needs to have an adjustable nozzle. It should have a pump action and it should be able to spray a very fine mist. You're also going to need water in a container. Water is the cleanup medium for acrylics. Nothing better. Plain ordinary old tap water. In the bottom of that jar, put a nylon scrubby from, your, uh, from, from the grocery store. These are pot scrubbers and you can buy them. They're made out of nylon. Just shove it down into that jar and I've got a green one in there. And what it'll do is clean your brushes without ruining them. Um, brush manufacturers are out to get you to buy lots of brushes and the reason they do that is because if you destroy your brushes real fast you'll have to buy more brushes. It's logical, right? Well, I use this because it does not do serious damage to the brushes. Next item on your list is saran wrap. Saran wrap is plastic wrap. There are lots of di different manufacturers, but I gotta tell you, the best one to buy is saran wrap. And I have to say that because I've tried them all, and for pure ability to prevent your paints from drying out, nothing beats saran wrap. And I, I don't own stock in the company. It just works. So get yourself a box of saran wrap. You're also going to need uh, some paper towels for putting your paints out on. 
Now, when you're ready to start painting, what you'll do is take a single paper towel and you'll fold it in half long ways and you'll fold it in half again. And then you're going to put it away from you and then spray it with your spray bottle. Next, you're going to need some brushes. Brushes come in all shapes and sizes. They are all filberts. For my painting session today, I'll be using a number 12 filbert made by silver, a number 10 filbert made by silver, a number, well, it's size 14, but in reality it's a size 6 by Galleria, which is another brand. I'll use a number 2, also by Galleria, filbert again. And for detail work, I will use a small round, probably a number 2 round five brushes. If you use more than five brushes, you're probably using too many. I've seen artists who use different methods than me having, they look like porcupines. <laughs> Their hands are absolutely loaded with brushes, all different colors, each one in a different finger, and I don't know how the heck they can keep themselves organized. I know I can't. I like keeping things simple, so five brushes, no more. One of the rules about working with acrylic paints, though, is that your brushes like to be wet. And before you ever put paint in your brush, it's a good idea to wet them. Just get them wet. Get in the habit of keeping a wet brush. The reason being is if you do not keep a good wet brush, what will happen after a while is your brushes will end up looking like this poor old soul. I show him to you. You can see the paint way down in that ferrule right there. That paint keeps this brush from being a good brush anymore. It's lost its flexibility. Now, paints. Oh boy. There are more paint manufacturers than Carter has little pills. Every company on the planet makes paints, it seems like. You've got Winsor Newton. You've got Da Vinci. You've got Sheba. Well, I think they went out of business. I'm not sure. You've got Rowney. You've got Golden. You've got Liquitex. One of the bigger names, one of the more well-known. Liquitex and Golden are my two favorites. Now again, I have bought virtually every paint there is just to try them. I really enjoy seeing the different colors and handling the different paints. Uh, I really like Liquitex, and the reason I like Liquitex is because they show you on the tube whether they're transparent, translucent, or opaque. And this is really important stuff to know when you're working with color and with acrylics. So having that on the tube taught me an awful lot. I don't need it now, but boy, when I was learning, it was wonderful. Uh, golden colors doesn't do that. You have to know what the pigment is and then you have to know if it's transparent, translucent, or opaque. And these things are, uh, they don't tell you these things in, in schools and such. So having it on the tube is a good thing. I like Liquitex for that reason. The colors that I use I'll talk about later when I actually set up to start painting. There are some oddball things that you may want to have around. This happens to be uh, one of those craft containers. I put my acrylic paints in here and I can travel with them. Um, you're going to need some medium. This is, happens to be Liquitex's matte medium. Um, I usually have a small container that I keep it in. Uh, a surface on which to paint. Now, if you're just beginning, you're probably saying, what do I need to get in order to have a good surface to paint on? Well, I can recommend that you go and buy a pad of canvas made by Fredericks. This is Fredericks. They come in lots of different sizes. But you know what? You can paint on anything with acrylics. You can paint on <laughs> clothing. You can paint on glass, even though it's easy to clean up. You can paint on your walls. You can paint on fabric. You can do, you, acrylics are so magnificent, you can paint on virtually any surface with them. I'm going to be using one of Frederick's Artist Canvas, a 16 by 20, and it's a medium textured cotton duck. The first thing I'm going to show you my pill boxes. Yes, ordinary seven day of the week pill boxes that you can buy from your local pharmacy area in your grocery stores, usually. They're an inch and a quarter by about three quarters of an inch deep. This bag was filled six months ago, and I'm still using the paints that are contained in the pill boxes. Sealed moisture. Inside the bag is a wet paper towel that I replace periodically. The paints themselves are set in the two 
seven day pill boxes by temperature. Now those of you who have my colorful oil painting series will recognize the cool box and the warm box. Since this DVD is not about the color system, I will just give you the list of colors. In the one box, in the cool side, we have a titanium white that I use for mixing cool colors. We have a cool yellow, lemon yellow. We have yellow ochre. There is alizarin crimson and a piece of velcro. And we have phthalo green, ultramarine blue, and in the last bin I have placed burnt umber. In the warm box, I have the colors titanium white again, cadmium yellow, medium, cadmium orange, cadmium red light, sap green, phthalo blue, burnt sienna. And the reason why these boxes are six months old without drying out is inside the lids. Inside each individual lid is a small piece of adhesive felt. I cut a strip of it here for you to show how it's fuzzy on one side and there's adhesive backing underneath this paper. You cut them to fit the inside of the lid. You peel the backing off of it and then you put the adhesive side on the inside of the lid of the pill box. That little piece of adhesive felt is kept wet. The paint goes in here. This is a moisture area. When the lid is shut, the paint stays wet. One other thing I think is very important for you to know about painting with acrylics. Not only do you need to moisten your paint brushes before you begin painting, but the depth of the water in your jars is very important as well. If the water depth is over the depth of the ferrule, which is the metal part of your brush, this is the metal part of your paintbrush right here, and if your water is deeper than that, you will end up with destroyed brushes over a very short period of time. This brush has been misused. Notice how it wobbles. What has happened is the water was too deep, the brush was in the water, it swelled, contracted, swelled, contracted, and the ferrule is now loose. And this brush is pretty useless for making anything other than just covering canvases with gesso. When you buy acrylic paints, you have a choice of several levels of quality. The most basic level is called a student grade. Here's an example of a pack of student paints offered by um, Academy Grumbacher. And these are student paints, and look, these great big fat tubes. Oh boy, oh boy. The problem with the great big fat tubes is you're getting a lot of filler and probably not very much pigment. But a student grade paint is cheaper because of the amount of fillers that are put in it. When I'm finished painting and I'm ready to put my boxes away, what I will do is I will get out that plastic bag and that wet paper towel, checking it over to see if there's any mold. I'll put the wet paper towel inside the bag, take my spray bottle and mist my box outside, just as an extra precaution. Remember, six months on this one set of boxes and into the bag they will go. This kind of pill box seals down very tightly with a good seal. That is very important. The more paint you have, the better painting you're going to get because you'll have, you won't break your concentration doing this job while you're trying to paint. Here's my gray palette. It's a clear sheet of glass under which has been painted a neutral gray value. As you know, I see the colors better on a gray background. Titanium white's my first color. It's opaque, made by Liquitex. My second color is cadmium yellow light. Notice I put out an inch and a half of color on this wet paper towel. Inch and a half of color doesn't dry out as quickly. A lot of paint, but I'll show you how later on I save those colors so nothing goes to waste. My third color is cadmium red light. Don't use cadmium hues. They're a poor substitute and they don't mix cleanly the way cadmiums, true cadmiums do. My fourth color is acro violet. It takes the place of alizarin crimson. I used to use alizarin, but I found out it wasn't completely light fast, so now I'm using uh, acro. 
The next color I put out is Thalo Blue. Sometimes I use Ultramarine, but Thalo today because I have a gorgeous blue in this cloth that I'm painting and I want to be sure to capture that and Thalo is the color for this. My next color is Thalo Green. Now Thalo Green plus the Acra creates black. So if I need a dark, luminous black, that's how I get it, by mixing those two colors. And they are transparent so they will mix beautiful clean color. Notice the amount of paint. Again, a lot of paint. It won't dry out as quickly and I will tend to use more if there's more to use. My next color is a grayer and it is burnt umber. Sometimes my grayer is a color from the earth family like burnt sienna or, or yellow ochre, but today I'm using burnt umber. It'll gray any of the combinations of the other colors that are down here. And finally, my oddball color. I use an oddball color because it's my accent color that I use in various places in my canvas. Today, the accent color is Red Rose Deep, and it's made by Da Vinci. It's a translucent color, meaning that from the tube, the light comes through it a little bit. What I'm going to do is following my rough sketch and glancing occasionally at the still life setup, I'm going to actually paint with a dark color the rough guidelines of my design. Notice how I tick to get the accuracy of the oval on the platter, the plate that's over there. And I want to be sure to get that because that's a quintessential part of my design. I have a lemon, actually they're limes from our tree over here, it carries you in. I just love the way that diagonal comes down and goes right through that rose. That is such a beautiful a line. Brings you right into the, into the painting. What's important is the, um, the structure of the flowers linking to the top, the left, and the design on the bottom. And I have a free edge over here. That connectivity means that I've got linking here, 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 and here. This edge is clean. The, the design will fill the space and this free edge is, is the resting point for the eye, so to speak. Notice how loose it is. I wait a few minutes to let it dry, and then I'm going to start putting my layers on. I'll be going uh, into my dark transparency. I think I'm going to make a violet, a wonderful violet color, and I'm just going to have some real fun with it using my alcohol as I paint it up there. Notice I'm getting it quite runny, and I'm going to be putting it everywhere I know there might be a little bit of blue showing up by spraying it with alcohol. You'll see a resist happen. Let's put some more alcohol up there and see what happens. Look at that. If I spray it real slowly, I get a, um, uh, lots of big drips. If I spray really rapidly, I get almost an orange peel effect. And that's a spray bottle filled with plain rubbing alcohol, sprayed on top of paint that is thin enough to resist. That's an underpainting for what's going to happen later. And the reason I want it to be an underpainting, it's like <laughs> you have to have a foundation on which to paint later. You can't mix and lift colors like you do with oils, so you've got to build something strong underneath that you can paint over with some opaque colors. Notice how I'm holding my brush. If I want to be tight, I'll hold it like a pencil. If I want to paint with a free fluid motion, I will hold it as though I'm conducting an orchestra. Notice I'm not even caring so much about my lovely yellow limes. They would be lemons, but I know they came off a lime tree. I'm just covering them up. I could add a little yellow to that and make them a yellow <laughs> green, so you know that they're there. My goal is to cover the canvas to get rid of that white canvas. Right now, I want to see something interesting. You see, this is the orchestra. You have to have all of the pieces in the orchestra playing in tune so that when the soloist, my focal point, starts to play, everybody is in harmony and working. Oh, did I tell you that all paintings go through what I call the uglies? <laughs> this one's going to go through the uglies just like every other piece of art I've done. Every painting goes through the uglies. You know where most of them end up though? In the back of your closet, under your bed. <laughs> Those guys are just waiting to come out and be beautiful. All of these, almost all of these colors we have here, with the exception of this area running right through here and up in here, all of this is transparent. Now, what I have to do is let this sit and dry. You see, you want to keep working on it, but you can't because if you keep working on it, you're going to overwork it too soon. And the beauty of acrylics is by letting it dry, what will happen is when you come back in, you'll put another layer on top, but some of this layer will show through. 
Okay, now it's time to clean our palette. I put aside the alcohol and I get my trusty spray bottle. The spray bottle has the adjustable nozzle without which I'd be in deep trouble. Uh, I use a fine mist, I spray the paints and the palette. This kind of softens the paints and gets me ready for the next step. That includes a paper towel and my trusty dusty razor blade. Without that, I couldn't clean this palette right down to the glass. Look at that, slick, slick, slick. Cleans the paint off, wet or dry and then I just wipe it up with a paper towel. I use saran wrap to seal my paints when I go away. And I take a piece that'll cover both the paper towel and the pigments with an overlap of a couple of inches. This lays right on top of the paint after I mist it. Gently laying it down without pressing it onto the paint, I run my fingers all the way around the piles of paint and there's a pocket of moist air in there and these paints will stay dry for weeks. Okay, we're back from our break and it's time to continue on with our painting. I removed the saran wrap. You see, it doesn't pick up a great deal of the paint and if I need to use it, I can use that paint off the back first. I use the same brush I had before, which as you notice, I kept in the water. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and go into some of my other colors, my uh, reds and purples again, and take them down into dark value by adding a little umber. And I'm going to go across and make sure that I just oh, beautifully layer these colors in here. I'll put the reflections and all the rest of that a little later on, but for right now I'm still building the beautiful darkness that it's going to be my symphony behind which my focal point will be playing. Oh yes, this is going to be very lovely. And I'm not too concerned again about edges. Edges come later. Areas that are of no interest to the viewer, which are usually along the perimeter edge, I'm going to soften and make sure the values stay similar, meaning they won't be too light or too dark. There won't be a tremendous amount of contrast back there. And every time I add a little more white to my colors, I end up with a more opaque color. Now, you have to watch it because your opacity can work against you. Your opacity can hide the beautiful luminosity of what's going on underneath. This is an opaque which is the light side of this vase, but I'm putting the opaque on top of that beautiful blue violet that's under there. And as we come around to the shadow side, the opacity disappears. And I've got to work on those lilacs a little bit. So because I've added white to it, it's going to be opaque. I don't want to hide this wonderful texture that's under there, so I'm going to add a lot of water to it to make it more runny so that when I cover this area, that, that texture underneath will show through. You see how those colors, again, getting rid of the white, which will come back, trust me. <laughs> trust me. Now, again, more glazing has to happen, so we're going to let this layer dry for a little bit, and then we're going to come back. Now the canvas is completely covered. In the next section of the video, what we're going to do is we're going to start developing all of the layers that make acrylic paintings such wonderful medium to use. You don't use them like oils because you can't push the paint around, it dries. And because of that fact, building up a painting in layers allows you to create some marvelous effects. Again, we're still developing without adding too much white, getting those colors the way we want them to be, transparent. gorgeous because when we lay down the opaques they're really going to come alive it's just so beautiful the way that works and what does it take to be an artist well it takes a lot of patience and practice practice is the big one you have to practice and work at your craft uh, there's no shortcut unfortunately and you see that's going to be an apple so we have to uh, we have to think about that a little bit and I think I'll go ahead and make him a little greener cut in there and get his shapes established. Now we have a lemon down here. I have to be careful with the lemon because uh, if I make him too strong too soon I'll have to glaze over him and, and take him into the darkness. But I think I can put in this color without too much fear of losing of losing his lemoniness. So as I'm play, planting in these colors I'm remembering the entire orchestra not at any one time do I forget? I've got an entire orchestra to consider. Now it's time to spritz the palette. I can feel it getting starting to drag. When the, pa when the palette starts to drag on you, that's when you grab your spray bottle. And you'll grab it often. 
as you become an acrylic an ac uh, accomplished acrylic painter by grabbing it often you'll prevent your paints from drying out I want the lighter colors of the cloth but I want it thin meaning I want it transparent I want it warm and transparent but the lighter areas of the cloth have to come in so I have a player against which the rest of the canvas will, will have a roll. Ooh, my goodness. I first met acrylics way back in the 70s in my university days, and I hated the instructor. Therefore, being with the wisdom of the young, I also hated acrylics. <laughs> so I never picked them up after that, and that was my, my mistake. In 1983, I saw a workshop where uh, an artist was using acrylics in the most unbelievable way and I said oh wow I've got to figure out what this person is doing I want to do that so I, I went back to acrylics and uh, was pleasantly surprised at, at what had happened to them <laughs> actually I, I grew up for um, the last 20 years I've been using them and absolutely loving the way they handle the colors that they mix the the glazing is what really uh, cooks my toast. I love how these colors glaze and you can change the character and the nature of a color by glazing over it with a transparent or a semi-opaque. So I'm building these up. I'm bringing these lights out where I see them in my still life setup and I'm leaving that gorgeous transparent ribbon of blue to play against it. You see one of the nice things about acrylics is their the contrast again between transparent darks and the opaque lights it's just working and it's just so pretty and you see am I worried right now about these flowers and my center of interest and all of that no 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 they're all bit players you've got to get the beauty of the of the symphony orchestra again I repeat myself you've got to get the beauty of the symphony orchestra playing before you start pulling in your soloists this is my soloist, this is my soloist, they're going to play a duet with this third section up here acting as a foil and a backdrop for them. And I haven't added any pure white to this yet. Now I've got that, that interesting red, <laughs> oh is it ever red, on this plate which goes right here. And I'm going to put that in too. That's a nice color balance. Bring, you've got red, red, red don't have any red over here but it isn't needed. Because my palette has been sprayed every color is still quite moist. They're not drying out quickly. And because of that gray palette I'm mixing on I can get good color. Anytime you put anything into a painting you want to be sure that it helps the design and doesn't hurt it. Cover that canvas really fast with color and then go back into it and start adding layers watching your opaques and transparents. Again knowing what the color does takes practice and the only way to get practice is to do it. Now understand that this painting is just one of hundreds of paintings that you have to do and you better get started <laughs> because painting is, like, is, is, is the art and you got to do them in order to get better. I look at every painting I complete and I say okay what did I learn from this one and what am I never going to do again and then I move on. I don't go back and try to fix canvases Remember, painting is a process, not a product. In the section that we just finished, we covered the canvas with lots of layers of transparent color. Some of it's semi-opaque, but most of it's transparent. That luminosity, because of one thing laid upon the another against the background of the white canvas underneath, creates something akin to a stained glass effect, which is a marvelous way to utilize acrylics. Now in the next section, what we're going to do is we're going to start laying down opaque colors that literally float on top of the transparent layers underneath. Okay, watch what happens. I'm laying up some the the shape of the petal on that upper rose. I'm mixing up some light white color for those the peony that's up here. Over here we have that lovely large peony. We're gonna need its shape. 
You notice in my mixing, I'm over here on the opaque end of my palette. I'm changing the colors slightly as I move around. For example, there's whites with a little blue in it up near the top for this rose that's up here. Using my brush expressively to create the illusion of violet petals. Now the violets on the other side are redder, so when I go over here, I'm going to go ahead and put in some redder colors. And again, because we took the time to play the symphony underneath, we got good stuff going on here. Now we come down and we start thinking about this area. Now that blue, navy blue stripe, you know how gorgeous that is with the transparency on it. When I put a little bit of opacity on it, it makes those transparency even more beautiful. I'm not going to cover them completely. I told you they're too important. I can make it lighter than it really is because I can always glaze it back down into the dark spectrum with an additional layer of color. If I hadn't mentioned it before, a reminder, acrylics always dry a little darker than they appear. Now this painting is galloping into the uglies. Trust me on this. It will come galloping out the other side, and it will, but we have to keep Keep reminding ourselves every painting goes through the uglies before it comes out the other side. Now there's an interesting thing going on over on this left side. Right there is some yellow being reflected off this. So I have to be sure to put that in there, which I have done. The half inch brush is going to take care of some tighter areas. Notice the difference in the color. Whoa! Isn't that beautiful? I think I'll make, mix a little orange with it make it an orange or color as it comes around on the light side. Ooh, yummy. And I'm going to go ahead and paint that apple. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm having too much fun. <laughs> if you have a cosmetic sponge like this, you can put it in water, moisten it. You can get it nice and wet. And then you can dip into a, a color that you like, and you can dab onto your canvas and then smear it a little bit. You create a texture that's not possible to have any, way, any other way. And creating interesting textures with acrylics is a lot of fun. When you're done, just throw it back in the jar and it'll wipe itself off. Okay, up until this moment, we have not used our matte medium or our gloss medium. I'm going to use gloss medium, which I've decanted into this jar. When I open it up, I just make a habit of spraying it. It's just a habit. It keeps it a little moist and any time it, tend it tends to evaporate, at least I know I've done what I can to keep it from drying out. And it allows us to do what's called glazing. And I'm going to start doing a little bit of glazing, especially on that vase. It's dry. The transparent glaze binds and unifies. It's a subtle effect. This is where I can glaze and reduce and, and push away uh, some of the things that I've been working on. I'm going around the backside of some of these flowers. I'm laying in some glazing now on top of that color that I put down that was so br brilliant before. It's, it reduces the intensity of those powerful colors I was putting down and tends to unify the entire picture. And it's also great for making shadows. I'm going to take some of this and put a little brown in it. And it just, it just makes it absolutely gorgeous. See, I'm going right across the bowl, taking the bottom of the bowl and pushing it away by giving it a little bit more of a shadow. I still have to come up with light here, so I'm going to go over these and push them back a little bit so I can bring them up to light again. I can see that I need some yellow here, nice yellow on this painted pear that's in the bottom of this dish. The apple also gets some of it. Now I can use the matte medium with the apple and highlight its entire side bring it up in value by glazing over it with this lighter color and yet still having the underneath colors showing through. Then I'm painting what I see and because it's a glaze the, the color underneath still shows through. Yeah, look at how that light's starting to come alive now. Ooh, I'm so happy with this. I hope you have good days too. And with acrylics, when in doubt, paint it out. And you do that by uh, grabbing your, your gesso and just laying a thick layer of, of uh, gesso on top of whatever you're doing and you're down to a brand new canvas again. And I've done that. I need to put a little warm glaze in the bottom of that rose. 
easy enough to do. Now you see I'm coming back in, but where I'd put that white color before, I've glazed over that to make the pinkish color, and now I'm coming back in and putting in some brighter color. So you notice how I'm holding my brush now? I'm painting more details, therefore I'm having a tighter hold on my brush. If I were to give you a homework assignment right now, I'd have you go ahead and start a canvas and see how many interesting layers you could make. How's that for a starting homework assignment? How many layers can you make and let some of the under, under part show through? <laughs> I know you can do it. The paint actually gets thicker and more opaque as I go lighter. We have this wonderful lipstick color when mixed with cadmium red creates the vibrant reds that are in the peonies. I want your eye to go right through here and over in here. So this apple is too light and too important. This edge of this lime, which is really looking like a lemon, is too important also. So I've got to do some fixing in here. Glazing is your fix it. So you take your glaze and then I pick a color that's going to make that go away. And my grayest color that's still transparent or translucent is my burnt umber. So I take some glaze with the burnt umber in it and I literally paint it right on top of that apple. Warm up the back sides of these flowers and you see the subtlety of it is that it unifies without being a real strong statement. Now one thing I do want to do is I want to add blue and white together and create some lighter areas on that navy blue striping. I just don't want to lose the beautiful transparency that I have where it's um, been painted with all those layers. I don't lose that gorgeous color and transparency. It's still in the background playing with my symphony. I want to lighten up this side. Now you see because it's a glaze it does not obliterate any of those reflections. It hides them a little bit. You've taken care of everything else that, needs, that needed taking care of in the picture. So now you can just start slathering on the paint to really punch that up. So when do you know when to stop? You know when to stop when you're happy with it but you're ready to start your next piece of work. Um, I don't have any ironclad rules about what makes the stopping point except that when I feel like I can't do any more to it without hurting it, that's when I really lighten up and, and, and start taking stock of what's in front of me. You see now, as the glazing medium goes over the different areas, it picks up, to, it, it becomes different color. Now I see an opportunity for glazing here to show you what I mean. Look at this area right here. It's pretty well all the same. And I know that I can fix that by coming in here and putting a dark glaze on top of the lights to push back a section of those flowers beautifully so that your eye will see them in a different space. You see, and I push them back, unifying certain areas and losing others. And push these back a little further too. You see how easy that's done? A layer on top of the layer that's already there. The contrast um, helps the viewer's eye to go where you want it to go. And we always try to control the viewer's eye because we're the artist. We determine where things are supposed to be and, and where people are supposed to be looking. In this very short section, I'm going to show you how an equine painting is developed using this method. You'll see me start with a plain canvas, the drawing, the layers, the blocking in of the large shapes, and then the painting will come to fruition as I continue to make those shapes go smaller and smaller with more and more detail. It's the way I paint uh, with most oils and acrylics, and on location, it's just absolutely the best method for me to achieve a painting quickly and most satisfyingly. Now I'd like to show you how acrylics can be used in different ways. 
In this first painting that I have in front of you, you'll see that there is a lot of texture. Now the texture is achieved by having handmade paper go down underneath the first layers of paint. You see, acrylics are a glue. Anytime you have any kind of paint or medium on your brush, you really do have a wonderful glue. Check out the texture that has made that handmade paper as those painting layers have gone on top of it. It adds a tremendous amount of interesting texture to the work that's produced. You might recognize this painting, also done with handmade paper underneath the paint, as the cover of Equine Visions magazine for 2002. The texture created by the handmade papers creates an interesting variety of brushwork not possible any other way. This painting was done near my home of an oak tree and some rocks. It was done mostly with a palette knife. Now if you want to thicken your paint up, you can thicken acrylics with gel medium. They come in, come in several different varieties, heavy gel, um, glossy gel, solid gels. Anyway, if you buy a gel medium and mix it into your paints, you'll end up creating something that makes a heavy bodied paint thicker than when it comes out of the tube, and you can use it with a palette knife to create some beautiful and interesting effects. This is a 9 by 12 inch piece of canvas that's been prepped with a little bit of paint and then spritzed with alcohol. Here you can see not only the texture of the brush, but also the resist created by the alcohol on the canvas. It's dry and ready to take on another layer. You can see how acrylics can be used very thinly, like watercolor. As I zoom in on this, you can see the individual layers of color, but they're all very transparent. This is a painting that I did several years ago, and it's a fabric collage. I call it a fabric critter, and I'd like you to look closely at some of the details on this. You can actually see the pieces of the fabric in the painting that were cut to fit the specific locations for this particular work of art. I really enjoyed making this painting with the lace and the uh, wonderful fabrics that were available to me at the time. Uh, even in the neck of the horse you can see there's a floral piece that's been overlaid with enough glazes to bring it in to become part of the horse's coat. Everything else was just uh, cut to fit, glazed over and held in place by the acrylic paints. Absolutely a wonderful medium for fabric collage. This is another painting of a fabric critter, this one a cat called Shelf Life, and you'll see each canning jar is filled with a different type of fabric which has been glued down in place using the matte medium and also painted over with acrylics. We're going to add all kinds of odd things to the surface of the canvas and create a fun little painting. One of the reasons they're so much fun is because everything in acrylic paint is a glue. The glue, which is the, the gel with natural sand texture gel in it. Here's another one, blended fibers texture gel made by Liquitex. Golden makes a whole bunch of them, but the basis for all of them is gel medium, and this happens to be the soft gel gloss. What I do is I use the gel like paste and I take some gel and then I go to the canvas and I paint some part of the canvas and then I put the paper on and then I paint over it. And I can also use pigment to glue it down mixed with the gel and then it goes up and paints on top of it. Possibilities are endless and we'll just continue to lay this down. It doesn't obliterate what's underneath if I want to add some natural sand for texture, and the palette knife will can be used on the canvas to create textured layers. Also, you can mix it with pigment. Excuse me, gel. That's the sand. And sometimes the accidents that happen are just so wonderfully dynamic. You let these layers dry in between, and then when you come back on, there's, they have a texture to them that also adds additional brush mark textures when you paint on top. This is flyaway artificial gold leaf. <laughs> oh, it's too much fun.
what would Van Gogh have done had he had these materials? And I just have some fun laying that down. Now that'll have to dry for a minute. It'll actually take about 30 minutes to set up. This is now completely dry. It sure does make it a lot of fun to work with. Let's paint Uncle Willie, as I'm going to call him. Now, since his skin is in place, let's go ahead and have some fun with him. <laughs> oh, heavens, let's see. I've got some yarn and some feathers. Now, again, the, the medium and the object that I want to glue, in this case, a piece of hair. Now, remember, the medium will dry clear. So it actually just does nothing except seal it down for me. Because acrylics are a fantastic medium for playing. Now the feathers, I was thinking I'd give him some epaulettes. Again, a layer of the feathers on top for his epaulettes. As I work with these, I never know how they're going to end up. They just end up pleasing me and make me laugh. And isn't that what art is about, to bring us joy and happiness? Another layer, just to set off what I need to have set off. Because my brush mark goes across with the texture that's already there, it creates interesting texture underneath it. I brought over an interesting piece of handmade paper to use for his cravat. I just soaked it in water to soften it. Now quite soft. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it up here as a cravat. I'm literally going to dress the old guy. I'm going to take some more of the medium, paint it up there, and mash the paper down, and then paint on top of it. By mashing it full of the medium, I will end up having that sealed to the canvas. Now when that dries, that will be rigid and protected. Let's make this gentleman have some sense of humor. There we go. <laughs> ah, every uncle I never had. I can go down to my smallest brush, which is a 3 8 inch filbert. Go into some of my darker colors. I love these little hairs sticking out of his nose. Oh dear. <laughs> now he needs a monocle. And you can see that it will fit right there. However, to hold it in place, I'm going to use another one of those fantastic mediums that comes with acrylics. Gosh, these feathers are everywhere. <laughs> Blended fibers. And I'm going to put it up there like it's his cheek. I'm going to put it, and there it goes, in two places. I'm going to hold it in place with the gel. Everywhere I place this stuff, it will end up holding good old Uncle Willie's monocle. While it's wet, of course, it'll slip around. Again, gluing it down with acrylics, that's how we do it. Isn't that fun? <laughs> I applied the chain by using some more of that texture medium. And I can move it a little bit, which I think I will do before it gets dry. The rest of the chain hangs loose. That's the beauty of these kind of paintings. They're just, <laughs> they're so much fun to do. The source material for this painting are photographs that I took myself when you are dealing with multiple source material, as in this case, it's always a good idea to do a plan so you can position them properly. Now I'm just going to draw a rough rectangle, and that's the perimeter of my canvas. Do not use the edge of your sketchbook for your drawing. You need to see the, the structure within the space of the sketchbook. Making a good design for your painting before you ever set a brush to the canvas goes a long way to making a good painting when you finally get that brush on the canvas. 
I take my brushes and I wet them all and put them in the water. And I keep handy my trusty spray bottle of alcohol and my spray bottle of water. Notice they're different. I need that kind of help. And I go into my transparent side of my cool palette. I get rid of the white and I tone the canvas where I have something with which to work texturally and value-wise, bringing it down. So I'm going to just dab it with my paper towel to create interesting textures. And acrylics allow you to create beautiful textural marks without using your brush. All of these textural marks will create interest underneath the trees that are going to be put in place a little bit later down the road. So the distance is going to be gray-green. So of course I mix up blue green, a little white, not much, gray it down, and off we go. Keeping it transparent by cutting back on the white that I'm using also helps to maintain transparency, and again, I can always lighten it up later. Now I jump to a smaller brush so I can lightly sketch in the location of my action figures in the water. are not important. You find them later. I tend to find the focal point by moving upwards from wild and crazy and then I tighten down where I want my, my viewer's eye to go. Many artists work in the opposite way. They start with the details and then go out to the fuzzies. I find that going from the fuzzies to the details suits me. So when you paint, it, it's always a good idea to keep in mind that one's focal point one of the things I want to do in this painting is to bring sunlight that's not in my source material. The reference photograph for the mules, the sunlight is on the side nearest to us. And in this case, it was also an overcast raining day. So I have my work cut out for me, but that's what makes art art. You take your source material and you use what's between your ears to make a good painting. Now the water in this stream is kind of an earthy uh, earth color. I don't like it. So I'm going to make my water bluer. Where I, where I think it would be, and blue-green, so it'll be more like a mountain stream. Notice I paint this right through their legs. I can always get their legs later. I know where they're going to be. It's so much fun. All these layers just making gorgeous color. Again, I'm not in the warm box at all. I'm painting things at distance, laying in some foreground rocks. The reason being, um, in, there are none in the composition that work. But if you put foreground rocks in your painting, you'll have um, a place for the viewer to stand. So there's something to think about. Give your viewer a place to stand in your work. Again, piece of glass, neutral gray. Great palette. And my paints in their little bins are staying here very happy and wet. And the cleanest paint is way up here close in the near side of the box. So as I work, uh, if I want clean color, I put my brush vertically into the box. If I don't care particularly, I'll go in at this kind of a 45 degree angle into the box because I'll be picking up the dirty stuff that's in the back side. When I'm ready to refill the box, what I generally do is I take all the paint that's here and shove it to the back and then put the new clean color closest to the near edge. Now it's time to take out one of my trusty dusty friends, a good old cosmetic sponge. When I want to create texture in trees, I really enjoy using a cosmetic sponge like this. Let's see, I'll go ahead and get some of my yellow green, mix it with a little bit of my uh, ultramarine blue, dab the sponge, go over to the painting, dab, 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 dab. <laughs> this is almost as good as the alcohol because it creates texture that isn't possible any other way. And the texture that you create is unique. Uh, it's accidental. Sponge also can work as a great brush. And it gets rinsed off in the jar. Notice I haven't done my figures at all. I don't care about them yet. It's too early. I'll get them later. Anytime I need to make a black, I can mix my thalo green, which is the blue shade, and my red, and I will get a gorgeous dark black color that will work for accents. Clean the palette time. I do a lot of palette cleaning, but my paints are still staying beautifully moist. I clean the palette a lot because as it gets dry, you want it to uh, not pick up little flakes of paint anywhere. 
Uh, those, don't, those look nasty on your canvas. <laughs> I think I'll add another layer of trees. A little bit of the cool yellow, a little white, a little phthalo green. Oh, that's an electric color. That will never do. So what we do is we kill it back with our burnt umber. Add a touch of red to it. Yeah, now we have a lovely olive green. Now if I lose a horse's nose on this, I'm not concerned because it, I can always find it again. That's the nice thing about acrylics. Um, when in doubt, paint it out. If you lose it, you can always come back and get it again. I'm also putting in some dark areas in the distant trees just to give us some shadow contrast against when the sunlight hits the top of the, um, the pack saddles on both the mules and the back of the yellow slicker. I really want that to pop. So my putting in a darker patchwork back in there helps to establish the contrast that's going to be essential later. I paint negatively around my subject and then my subject just comes out. Slightly smaller brush now. This is a half inch filbert. And for the very first time I'm going to get out my gloss medium, put a pile of it down, and mix up some color. Now the reason again the gloss medium creates glazes, and at this time what I want to do is establish my water to make it look more like water, but it's creating the feel of the waterfall, which I absolutely love to paint. Now, if you've been on my daily paintings group, you know that I've done over 600 paintings as of uh, summer of 2007. Talking to the people via email is a constant joy as well. I absolutely love what I do. And I'm so appreciative and so pleased that people find value in what I send out with my emails. As you can see, I'm creating, with this glaze, the real appearance of water. It'll also lighten the water behind the mule. So I'm literally picking out the mule's anatomy by painting the water behind it lighter. for me to continue to texture up the background, lightening up those trees, using my handy dandy super humma humma whiz bang sponge, and making sure that those trees come up in value but still end up staying in the background. Hmm, let me see. Oh, I'll use a little yellow ochre, a little bit of the phthalo green, and a touch of the blue again, a little bit of white. Notice I stayed completely in my cool family because that's due to the distance of the trees. Except for way back here. All textural marks made interesting. Darker color. Distant blue your trees off in the distance and still what's underneath continues to come out and show up even though there's about five layers here right now it's all creating a texture that's interesting for the viewers eye now I'm going to start laying in some of my lighter colors using my warms But in doing these kinds of details, this is where the sponge makes the shortcuts. The brush is coming in now to do some work, but the shortcuts are already in place. This water is in shadow, so it's not going to get the sparkly whites that they're actually in my reference shot because uh, those will be accents. absolutely love to paint this way from dark to light using acrylic setting up a most interesting background to start with 
and then embellishing and making it work as a painted picture. And acrylics dry one half of a value step darker than what you put up. So you, that's one of the reasons by painting dark to light, you can really make a cautious choices that later on you can lighten it up even more. That's why painting dark to light gives you the opportunity to start from the dark and move to the light. Sounds like a religious experience. <laughs> oh dear. Get serious, Ellen. upside down if it'll get the message to you. I hope you've enjoyed the work I've in this detail section to show you um, how the layers underneath just create the accent places for the water to come spilling over. I continue to get lighter and I will because I have to in order to convey the spilling water. By making this interesting the rest of the painting just sort of gets in line right behind it and everybody everybody starts working. Gosh I love to paint. I mean, where else can we practice something and if we went in doubt, wipe it out and not have it under the scrutiny of anybody looking at what we're doing? <laughs> Unless it's like me here in this room taping these tapes and knowing that, that anybody anywhere can watch me make mistakes. <laughs> I really, really enjoy painting every way. Now this waterfall that I'm working on here is important because it's near my focal point. This one over here is important, but I won't put as much light on it. It's got a larger area, and if I made it as light as this one, it would be too important. It's bigger, but it's less important. Now I get to do the fun stuff. I, can, I got to do the details on the horse and rider and the mules. Oh boy! <laughs> and the packs are going to be yellow ochre, that I already know. I'm completely painting them solidly with yellow ochre. And there's still texture showing through from what's underneath, which will be an asset. But all I do is I get the basic shape in place using just ordinary straight from the tube yellow ochre. And when I do the guy's yellow slicker, I have to change my um, action just a little bit. Go in here and get some good strong yellow, a little touch of orange to it. There. Do you see the difference between the two? The yellow ochre on the pack saddle and the brighter yellow, cadmium yellow, on the slicker on the guy on the horse. The back of the horse, it's in sunshine, so I go to my warm palette. First layer, there will be others. starts to really sing, doesn't it? I have about three layers to put on. Now the front of the horse that he's on is in shadow. Remember I made the decision here to um, uh, change the lighting situation. Somebody said to you, me, Ellen, you're just too darn serious in your videos. That's not you at all. So I said this time, heck, I'm just going to pull out all the stops and be myself. Just keep offering advice though and keep telling us what we need to know. Okay. Uh, A. Paint. Don't ever quit painting. The more paintings you do, the better you get. There are no shortcuts to good art. There are there's only miles of canvas. And the miles of canvas cannot be achieved any other way than by actually physically doing it. All the workshops in the world won't do it unless you take the time to spend the time creating art with your brushes your way. Like I said, many of the ways that I paint is to find the edges by painting around them. All I'm doing now is just filling in space. It's time for me to really start putting the finish on this painting that I started. So this painting now is going to go into a very garish segment. <laughs> Dipping into my warms, because these are my opaques, cadmium yellow medium being extremely opaque. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lay on thick paint 
and get this fellow to really show up. Down here, I need to put in the reflection. Now reflections are always darker, usually about a half value step darker than the actual object that creates them. So I can't make this as light, it has to be darker. Now we'll get down to getting the guy's hat. This is detail work, so I'm going to go ahead and show it to you after I've worked on it a little while. Just remember, the basic concept of what I'm doing now with these layers is most all of them are opaque, and they're all going to bring objects forward. Now, what I have done is to punch, which means to lay opaque layers on top of all of that transparent texture that's going on under there, and to create brighter passages, brighter moments, for the viewer to enjoy the light as it's falling across these mules and horses as they cross the stream. And the lights are what create the excitement. So what I'm doing now is just enhancing the feel of diagonal light coming across and hitting the center point and these uh, animals going across the water. Again, the light on my source material is nothing like the light that I'm putting on the actual painting, so uh, I have a lot of latitude in order to make it mine, which is where we draw the line at original art, because uh, original art comes from you, the artist. It is an adaptation of the source material that you choose to use to make your work. And now a few more embellishments you see can make a finished painting out of that. acrylics when I go plein air painting and so I thought I would go out this morning and show you how it's done and of course Vincent van Gogh is going along with us we're going out into Box Springs Preserve As you can see, not much has changed from when we were inside the studio. I don't have a glass palette with me. I do have butcher paper, which is freezer paper, which I buy from the grocery store and cut to fit and hold it down with postal mailing tape on a piece of cardboard. And this works extremely well, butcher paper, freezer paper, for using acrylics out in the field. For one thing, it's easy cleanup, and again, it's very economical. With the um, the seven-day pillboxes, you don't have to carry tubes of paint into the field, and this is always a good thing when you want to lessen the weight you have to carry. Of course, with Vincent van Gogh, I don't have to worry so much about the weight. The pillboxes are held together by Velcro, which is also Velcroed down to my Open Box M, which is one of the uh, palettes that I use in the field. I have several, but today I'm using this one to show you how easy it is to use acrylics in the field. I have my spray bottle to keep my paints wet. I will use that judiciously. The temperature today is running up towards 90 and it's very dry. So for me to paint in the field with acrylics, I must use a lot of my water bottle. I just missed everything, including myself. It feels wonderful. <laughs> and when we're ready to paint, we open the pill boxes. But again, those little moisture guys in the lids are really gonna keep your paints a lot moister for a lot longer than if you have them on your palette without any kind of protection at all. 
and now I'm ready to paint. It's so cool that I'm out here with my goat, my water bottles, my acrylic paints, and I'm just having a wonderful time plein air painting. As I'm working, of course, I keep my spray bottle handy, and this allows me to, to increase the working time of the paint that's on the palette without diluting it too much. You have to learn by practice just how much water to use out in the field to keep your paints wet. But again, it's real easy with the pill boxes because this is very moist because of my spraying initially and the moisture contained in the lids. I don't try for a finished feeling in a study that's done in the field with acrylics. I have to work too fast in order to get those tight details. If you want to paint in the same location day after day after day at the same time, you can generally work a lot slower and take a lot more time, but I found that by painting fast I generally get a looser feel to my work. When I'm out in the field I carry bottled water both for me and for using in my water container. But normally I have a little gizmo that hangs right here that holds enough water, a uh, plastic collapsible container for my brushes. Notice all of my brushes are in the water. Again, you have to maintain the same kind of criteria that you do when you're in the studio when you're working with acrylics in the field. When these guys are ready to go, as I am, I'll just stick them in a little plastic bag and keep them wet until I get back into the studio where I can wash them out. One of the nice things about acrylic paints is because they dry so fast, all you have to do is just put them away. Hello, boy. <laughs> Come on, oh, what a journey. Thank you so much for joining me with this acrylic DVD. We've done more paintings than we possibly thought we could in the time we're given, and it hopefully this will set you on your own journey. Every painting is a stepping stone, and when you take those stepping stones in your journey through your art career, they, each one of them is a little present that you give to yourself and to the world when you paint it. And those stepping stones by themselves probably don't amount to much, but if you use those stepping stones in their entirety, each one will take you forward in your journey as an artist. I hope you'll try acrylics and start having fun and painting fast and loose with this wonderful, wonderful painting medium. I enjoyed sharing what I know with you, and if you have any questions, please, please contact me at one of the contact information you see in the upper corner. I would be delighted to hear from you. I always answer my emails and I have a daily paintings list where the paintings that I do every day in lesson format, this was one of them, are available for you in your email. Again, thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining me in this journey. I've so enjoyed making the DVD and I absolutely hope you'll join me again. that get on? Did I record that? Oh heck, I hate it when this happens. Hopefully. Well, try again. Check this. <laughs> this is an outtake. <laughs> He's hungry. Okay, are you ready? Shoot! <laughs> I gotta remember the script. There is no script. Dry! Gosh darn it, when you want it to dry, it won't. <laughs> there is my drawing. You can recognize it. You can see the right. Oop, forgot the writer. <laughs> some days you're the pigeon, some days you're the statue. <laughs> <laughs>